the color change. So that, that made sense, all right? So they've evolved this different color pattern, but it was more complicated than that. So not every breeding male was solid black. Some of them <laughs> had, had more things, more and more. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, mix. it was like, okay, that, that would have been interesting enough. But sometimes we saw them that were half black and half white, like a regular Texas sickly. And sometimes, and we saw that in both the males and the females. Okay. And then sometimes we actually saw males that were pure white, like a female. And that we've seen pictures of those ones. Like yeah. I, has I, a great picture. Yeah. They're bright white. Yeah, yeah. Of, yeah, he's yeah. So he's got some really. Uh, um, I don't know if, if a photograph is famous, but he's got some pictures of some white females on um, his website yeah. and in various articles that show that that really bright white color. And uh, when I say all white, it's not. I mean, there's still the, the typical standard. I'll spots probably want to let me use the picture. And we'll put it up. All on right, the screen. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, but we also saw males exhibiting that, and I'm like, well, now what the heck's going on? <laughs> but um, <clears throat> one actually, um, this was largely. Uh, due to Kapil. So Kapil Mandraker, who I mentioned earlier, he took a lot of photographs and he just has a real knack um, for finding interesting things out in nature. And he um, took some photographs of three males, big males, they were all solid black and they were chasing an insect flying over the surface. And um, <clears throat> One of them finally got it. It was a cicada or something. That's what we were talking about the other day. Yeah, yes. we were talking about that. And um, the big male got it, and then he swam away. And, and, and Kapil has dozens of photographs of this, you know, taking it every, yeah. every second or something. And then as it swims away, it's slowly losing its black color and it's turning green, you know, more typical um, yeah. non-threatening color. And it's trying to hide, basically. It's, tr it's trying not to be conspicuous at that point. It yeah. doesn't want anybody to know it's around, and it doesn't want anybody, sure as heck, to know that it's got a great big insect sticking out of its yeah. mouth. Um, it doesn't want to have to have a squabble and to defend itself. Right, right it just wants exactly. to go and eat its prize. Yeah. <laughs> um, and similarly, um, we made some observations that um, where in which the males changed color in front of our eyes. So um, it's not like a thing that takes a couple days to happen. Um, even like a typical change to, to breeding color um, in in most of these species, you know, it occurs over a couple yeah, days. It's or gradual. Something. Yeah. yeah. Um, with this, I mean, it can happen in seconds. So when I saw a big black male swimming around and cavorting with other females and stuff um, for 10 or 15 minutes, um, going up challenging other males. Um, and then I, I, I also saw a, a white female guarding offspring uh, by herself for all this time. And I thought, well, maybe she just got abandoned or something. Yep. And, and that was about ready to leave. And this, this big macho, um, in, uh, threatening looking male came up to the female and just changed color in, in a matter of a couple seconds um, away from that dark black color to the white color yep. um, and it was almost like he was trying to say oh no no I'm not a bad guy I'm, I'm, I'm a good dad I'm a, really I'm still here me. Yeah. I'm still here <laughs> um, so we figured that out too that, that um, not only that there are different color patterns but why um, why they're different. And to me, that's absolutely fascinating. Yep. Uh, most of these cichlids are interesting in that they, they work together uh, to take care of their babies and everything, and that they change colors. I mean, Central American cichlids to me are fascinating already, but this species is really something special. Yep. And if that, that isn't enough, um, I, this kind of is the icing on the cake. Um, uh, for several years, people would ask me, well, if they've evolved this polygynous mating behavior, uh, you have all these other males kind of standing around with their hands in their pockets without any, without any mating opportunities. Do you ever see any sneaking behavior? And I had only been to Quadrocyanagus once, and, and I had fish in my tanks at home, so I was like, well, no, I haven't. Um, and then one day, um, about five years ago, or actually six years ago now, I guess, um, it was fall. For some reason, I get more most of my spawns in September and October, which I thought was weird, uh, especially in Ohio. They spawn year-round in Quattrocinigus? We, we're not really sure, but we think that they probably do. The okay. temperature, it's spring-fed, the yeah. temperature's constant Consistent. and everything, so they probably do. Um, but I was just sitting there and um, in my main tank, which is a, a regular standard 300-gallon, eight-foot um, mm -hmm. tank, um, the biggest male and the biggest female were a pair, and they would usually spawn. And I'd never seen the polygynous behavior um, until like two years ago. Have you ever had one of your males ever turn black in the aquarium? No. No. But juvenile. Because it so. doesn't have to. That, yeah. they, they, it took me so long. Yeah. You just got it in two seconds. It took me so long to figure that out. Um, <laughs> gosh. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, 
No, they, they were usually gray or, or just weakly get the, uh, the breeding colors. And the females would get the breeding colors. I mean, I, I saw the white males sometimes, definitely not often. Yeah. Um, but usually they would just kind of weakly express the, either the half and half color or the, um, or the white color. But these, this male and the female, they started spawning in it. And I had the, the tank right behind my computer. I was just typing, you know, doing, working like usual. And I, I turned around and, oh, the fish are spawning, like always. Okay. And they said, wait a second. And I saw a little fish um, up by the water surface, kind of hiding next to a floating log that I had in the tank, right above the spawning pair. <laughs> floating logs are there for hiding places because they're made. <laughs> um, oh yeah, yeah, I keep, I keep a lot of wood in it's the like tank. It's like keeping yeah. trophies. You need places for the guys oh, yeah. to get away. <laughs> yeah, I have um, actually in that tank right now, I've got two big pieces of driftwood, one on each end just yeah. in there. Um, but the fish was just pointed right at the breeding site. And they, they were... They just were, caught your eye. Yeah, there was, I'm going to look at this now. The fish was up here, kind of yeah. just looking right at it. Like, what in the heck is this thing doing? He's staring at these eggs. <laughs> um, and then I luckily got out a camera um, and took some video of it. And, and I just sat there for a moment. And sure enough, uh, the female would make a pass, lay a row of eggs on the rock. And the male that was kind of hanging out up there would shoot down really, really fast, <laughs> go belly up on the, on the spawning site, yeah. and then just kind of slink away yeah. um and they did not want him there they would yeah. they would bite him and chase him and try to get him get him away but only um, one pass or would he do it repeatedly oh, repeatedly yeah. many many times and uh, i thought well this looks like he's sneaking i, I couldn't see um milt coming out of it yeah. but um it looked like that's what was going on but but what really kind of proved it was that his genital papilla was huge um you know the genital papilla which releases the sperm from males and yeah. the and the eggs from females yep. on, on cichlids um, swells up at, at, at spawning, and this thing was not the main male, and his genital papilla was probably as yep. big as the spawning males. Um, and I have photographs of that too, and it was really cool, and um, it's on YouTube and stuff, and people can watch that. Tomorrow. Okay. Um, I'll and then, we'll try and put a link to that video. In the yeah, that would be yeah. really cool. It's, I mean, I've, I've, give, I've given it in talks a lot, and it, people like it. I mean, cool. it's, it's neat. Um, so there was just one more thing. I was pretty much done with the research. I was done publishing papers, um, but I still had never seen the male taking more than one mate in an aquarium. Now, other people have, so we know that Parachromus dovi in the wild is mm -hmm. polygynous, um, and the thought there is that it's just so big that they can, they can do it. They can do whatever um, they want. Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, Willem Hines has observed it in some cichlids in his giant cichlidarium tanks. Well, well Willem Hines, the one thing that was really cool for him in one of his DVDs that he released in Nicaragua is he noticed the behavior of those Nicaraguans mm -hmm. acting yeah, that's as amazing. babysitters or parental care for the dovi so they could go out and hunt, which is really unique. Like, that's not heard of in cichlids. And if we were to go back to, like, say, Lake Tanganyika, which may not be your specialty, but Lake Tanganyika... You've ever watched any of those videos of that big emperor cichlid? I, 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 um, I, I saw it on like a BBC special yeah. like 20 years ago. But, but I, the I, problem I, with that cichlid is it gets so big. There's so much competition. It has massive broods because a lot of them will get picked off, right? And uh, the parents will take care of the offspring until they're like six inches. Oh, the parents okay. are born off and die because they never <laughs> left. So once the parent, once the babies are released at a certain size that they're big enough, they, I think they're released because the parents may die. Wow. That's crazy. Like I that's crazy that. parental to the extreme, right? But maybe they need to evolve to find some sort of thing like the Dovi and the Nick Regrets relationship, yeah. you know, so they can have a date night. Well, that is, that's really weird. Uh, the, the current thought that um, Ken McKay, actually, who I mentioned earlier, yep. he's, he published that original study that observed that. And um, his idea was that, and it, I think he presented some pretty good evidence to support it, is that um, the um, Nick Regrets, it's not really a great breeder in that environment so you mentioned in your talk oh, yeah, the, that it the, the normally drills into the side yeah, the yeah. whole head shape for them is to die they basically act like a corpse mm -hmm. group because they can't compete for the breeding sites with all the different amphilophids and the dove yeah. eyes and the tropus capitalizes on being just so mean it finds those little niches this one can't capitalize on it, it just can't compete so the fact that it's still evolved to still be there it's yeah. had to find a way of adapting. Well, so it burrows into the side and makes a nuptial chamber and the lays non-adhesive eggs, well, yeah, which is yeah, another yeah, a yeah. unique trait. Yeah, and it does that. Um, Ron Coleman, I think, is the one that discovered that um, in, in his work in Costa Rica in these really, really um, high-speed streams yes. where they, they do that. But in a lake, it's a different situation. So um, 
Ken McKay and uh, Willem Hines in his video agreed with this is that they can't really compete that well, like you just said, and they get outcompeted by uh, Neotropolis, uh, Nematopus, yeah. um, which I, I want to make sure I'm using the, the, the current name, but everyone knows, I think, what I don't think that one ever changes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so um, anyway, the favorite food of Dovey is the knees. Yes. So if the um, if the nigrigwenza helps the dovey, um, I don't have this right now. Yeah. So um, then the dovey can go spend time eating the main yep. competitor of the nigrigwenza. So really cool. Yeah. Um, but I had never observed that. Um, Willem Hines reported it in his one of his big tanks in another species, and and it and it probably there are other reports of it happening here and there. Um, As hobbyists are building these much larger aquariums, yeah. that's starting to open the door for it. Like, I had a 750, now we're building a, in the new house, we've got built the whole basement around it, 12 foot by 6 foot by 4 foot. Oh my gosh. You know, but that's, the whole purpose is that. As you set that. it up so you can actually observe real behaviors. Yeah. You know? Yes, I agree completely. And I wish I could have a big tank like that. In my, I, unfortunately, I just don't have room for it in my house. Um, I saw the pictures of your old tank, and um, yeah, I, was, I would love to have that. I was 21 actually. years old, yeah. that tank, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, it, uh, Dean Hendrickson was mm -hmm. scaling down um, his live fish collection, and I went there a couple years ago and got the rest of his fish and brought them back to Cleveland, and I put a different big male in my big tank. And that, so, so I probably would have seen this polygynous behavior yeah. if I had a bigger tank like that, yeah. and if I had just more fish so with just a 300 you can't have a whole bunch of huge males so um i never <laughs> have a bunch that. of dead fish yeah <laughs> so even though it's big enough to elicit some natural behaviors it's still not like um like a lake or like a big zoo sized aquarium um but i put this other male in there and he did it so he f formed a pair bond with one female in a cave over at the side of the tank and then another as a couple weeks went by and the, the fry became free swimming another female kind of formed a little territory adjacent to that, turned white and started courting the male, and then he just mated with both of them. Now, do you and, think that for your original grouping that you had, were yeah. they fry that you brought back? And you no, grew up? That, was, that was like a 20-year-old male that I brought back. Oh, okay, back. so I'm just, yeah. I was just trying to problem solve, thinking that maybe the ones that you got the second time, they came from that big giant pool, you know, and they had those behaviors, and yours were just fry that never had a chance to see that behavior. I don't think so. So it, interestingly, this male, um, it was one of his oldest fish, and I think it had been in isolation for like two decades. It was so mean yep. that it had killed a lot of fish, and so it was just it just kind of lived on its own. But um, I mean, he got his he got his chance, I guess, there yep. at the end. Um, and he he had he guarded half the tank as his territory. Luckily, didn't kill everything in there. Yep. And then both females had their groups of fry next to each other in the half of the tank, okay. and they didn't like each other. But they um, they fought viciously, um, briefly, but viciously. A couple. But he times. got to live the dream for a little bit. Yeah, he did. He lived the dream. Uh, he, he put up with isolation for a long time, and then it, eventually it all paid off. Um, and so at that point, I was done really publishing research on these things, and um, a couple of things occurred to me. One is that Don Danko, um, the president of the yep. Ohio Cichlid Association, wanted to put together a Central American Cichlid issue for the um, the Buckeye Bulletin, which I have here. This is yep. the uh, publication of the Ohio Cichlid Association. So he asked me to write an article. I'm like, well, I've already published all my findings, but I didn't publish this observation of this polygynous mating behavior. And I thought it'd be nice to put that in, 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 in an article for people to read about um, because it's something that, that just doesn't typically happen in home aquarium. But also, a little summary um, of all the stuff that I've done, you know, in a short, readable, simple yes. um, explanation, but but with the photographs too, so people can Brought see. Brought down the more so hobbyists can understand it with all the with all the morpho and systematic yeah. stuff kind of taken exactly. out. Exactly, without a lot of detail, with um, but with photographs that people can relate to, showing the different color patterns, so the white males, the black males, the half and half males, all in comparison with um, a regular Texas cichlid, mm -hmm. um, so they can see that. Um, and so uh, that came out in June um, 2018. Um, but also, um, oddly enough, there were no other Quattrocyanica cichlids in the hobby. So I Is guess- Is there other Quattrocyanica cichlids though? Other than no, the, the, the wonderful jewel cichlid? No, no, I mean, I don't mean species. I mean, nobody had any. 
Mm. Um, they were around. That's very true. Yeah. So Mo Devlin, I think, had some in the late 2000s. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty sure he did. There was a guy up in um, Detroit that was breeding them for a while. Um, so they were around, um, and then they just dried up. And I was like, holy cow, I'm the only one in the United States that has these fish. Yeah. And if <laughs> I get rid of them, they're gone. Put them in jars in a museum somewhere. You can't They're get gone them all because wild. nobody will be able to get them again. Exactly. So, um, so I took those two batches, um, and I, I think I put some others into auctions and stuff and sold them. It, it, I, I had I had sold them in the past, but these were like the last ones I was ever going to breed. Yeah. Um, so uh, I donated a whole bunch of them to Odyssey Aquarium in Arizona, who's trying to set up, a, which is a new public aquarium in, yeah. in Scottsdale, and like a display for that region. Yes, they're area. trying to get a collection of desert fishes. So, mo you know, most zoos won't just take any donation, even if it's a rare fish, because they have collection plans and they try to abide by these. Yep. Um, they wanted some. Um, the San Antonio Zoo wanted mm -hmm. some. They have a lot of um, rare fish species that kind of focus on the Southwest region as well. So um, they agreed to take some. And then I thought, well, how am I gonna get them there? I'm not a, I'm not a fish shipper. <laughs> and uh, they're like, well, we want it shipped by Southwest. So I called Southwest and they're like, well, you need to be a known shipper, yep. which means that you, they have to come to your house and inspect <laughs> you. And I'm like, I'm not going through all this. I don't, I don't, have, I don't have an oxygen tank. I don't have all this stuff. So um, somebody referred me to David Hale, who um, yep. owns something fishy. And he's a busy guy. I was really impressed. And I mean, I had met him before, but we didn't really know each other real well. And he just agreed to help me out. He says, I ship fish all the time, bring them over. He spent half a day with me bagging up these fish, boxing them up, and driving them over to Southwest. These aren't a bag of fry either, these are like adults. There were some adults in yeah. there, yeah. Um, so it was it was a pretty big undertaking. And then um, I actually, uh, about a year later, gave some more uh, to um, Belle Isle Aquarium which in Detroit, which had recently reopened. Yeah. Now, so those groups are, or the, that community, I guess, of public and aquarium and zoo people, they're trying to establish a breeding program for them, but I also put a lot into the hobby. So I sold them here at the OCA a couple times. Um, uh, Mike Daudry um, bought a whole lot off of me about a year yeah. or two ago. And Mark Chalupka is Mark, breeding. He's brought, yes. he brought some into the fry for the auction already. Scott Myers bought a lot, Mark Chalupka. So um, the goal is that they don't disappear because I mean, from the hobby. Yeah. Um, I, 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 mean, I hope they this don't disappear from the wild. But. This is really truly a story that if they do disappear in the wild, in the hobby, they're gone. Yeah. Because you cannot bring them out. You just can't get them out. And what if <laughs> someone wanted to? What if someone wanted to read, read this? What if someone reads this article in ten years and would go, "Gosh, I'd really like to see these color patterns in my tank." They just wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. Or what if a scientist wanted to study? What if, you know? There, there are probably a lot of interesting questions that could be asked about using the system yeah. um, that ha that I didn't ask. I mean, just because I'm done doesn't mean that it's all it's all closed up. What, there might be some young PhD student that wants to investigate these further, and it would be a lot easier if he could just get them here in the United States than, than trying to um, mm -hmm. get them from Mexico. I, like you know, even with the scientific collecting scientific collecting permit, I don't know how easy that would be. It, it still might be impossible. Particularly that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rusty's talked several times in different talks where he's gone to certain areas and you'll be in a man of random stream in the middle of nowhere, 12 hours from somewhere and you'll be diving in the water, taking pictures and all of a sudden armed guards appear and they're there to protect the fishes of that area. Oh, really? They're paid for by the government. Like he says, he says, and they want to know exactly what you're doing. Yikes. <laughs> middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. That's good to see. Yeah, they're protecting their environments a little bit, Ben. Some areas, it's good to see. Oh, it's yeah. It's not the norm. Oh, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> well, one, th one thing that they're doing in Quadrocyanagus, um, I mean, I, I, I don't know if they're still doing this or not, um, but um, the jewel cichlid has been introduced in Quadrocyanagus, which was, we were talking about earlier, is just really crazy. But they're so serious about eradicating it that they actually had teams of biologists there in three shifts, 24 hours a day, um, setting out um, minnow traps to catch these things, pulling them in, sorting out the fish, putting the natives back in the, in the posa or the, the pond, yeah. and then taking the jewel cichlids and, and euthanizing them. 24 hours a day they were doing this. And, and like from, from an, a non-endemic, a jewel cichlid is not gonna really pose the massive threat to them. The terrifying yeah, from, one yeah. would be something like tilapia. Yeah. Then you know they would just outcompete them and they would stir the whole thing up. Unfortunately, yeah. there there is a couple locations in Quadrocyanagus that have tilapia. There. Yeah. yeah. It's just a matter of time. Um, They're everywhere. I saw them in Santa Tecla, which is which is the one spot in Quadrocyanagus that 
has Herichthys cyanogatatus and not okay. um, Herichthys minkli. Um, and that's actually Rusty Wessel so, uh, provided those in the hobby over the last, like, I don't know, six to eight years. You, you've okay. probably seen those. And actually, those were involved in that, that Facebook um, controversy where someone thought that they were the Santa Tecla uh, yeah. Herichthys. Um, but no, fortunately, um, most of the environments in Quadrocyanagus are still pretty pristine. Um, let's hope they stay that yeah. way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's hope they do. Um, but still, it would be hard to get fish out of there. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ron. Yeah, of course, Chris. Hope you guys enjoyed that. There's some authority for you on Herichthys minkli eye. You're not going to get it any better. Take care. All right, bye, guys. Thank you. <laughs>